totally different than what we get in an hour or two. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Hot mic. Hot mic. Is that our time? Hot. How was lunch? Good? Good. Mmm, there's a really good lobster roll place right down the street. I've eaten there three times this week. Is Texas known for their lobster rolls, Crobe? They are not, but the owner's from Boston, so it's okay. But where are the lobsters from? Didn't ask. <laughs> that was not in my uh, threat model. Mmm, big mistake. <laughs> Well, hello, everybody. I guess we are kicking off the afternoon track. Welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to talk about securing open source software end to end. Together. That's right. It's going to be pretty awesome. Let's see if I hit the right button. So very briefly, we're here to uh, we're going to define the scope. We're going to talk about threat factors of open source. And then uh, at the end, we have a modest proposal. And we'll take, hopefully have some time for questions and answers. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ann Bertuccio. I'm one of the leads in Google's open source programs office. One of the things we do and how our OSPO is organized is essentially all Googlers are able to contribute to open source. And my job is to help them learn those skills and, and do that you know, successfully, effectively, and in the spirit of open source. And that includes security and things like vulnerability disclosures, mm -hmm. one of my favorite topics. <laughs> uh, I'm Crobe. I do stuff. Uh, my day job is at Intel. But I spend a lot of time working with the OpenSSF and the uh, Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. Uh, I also love me some vulnerability management. Uh, so this is going to be a pretty exciting conversation, I hope. Hopefully we'll all learn a little, laugh a little. Have a little lobster. And have a little lobster, <laughs> not fall asleep. So um, Ann and I both have the privilege of working in an organization called uh, the Open Source Security Foundation. Anybody here heard of that? Everybody here a participant in a working group? Oh, less oh. hands. I smell new recruits. <laughs> Close the door. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is an industry coalition of both uh, industry vendors, um, uh, individual participants, maintainers, security researchers. It's a, a wide spectrum of people to come together and participate all with the goal of trying to help improve the overall security posture of open source. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the actions the foundation does and how we might be able to recruit some of you uh, towards the end. And we should mention, this is open source, so you do not have to be employed by any of these people. That's right. You can be independent, you can be between jobs. This is, we're here for you, the people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we're gonna start off and help kind of define the scope of our problem. Who here has seen this logo? Uh, I was uh, mandated by the foundation to put this on a slide. All, there was no problems before this. This was the uh, dawn of vulnerability management. Uh, but for those of you that might not have raised your hand, this is our friend Heartbleed. It was a problem with a open source project called OpenSSL, which uh, was uh, very popular back in the day, still is. And uh, at the time of disclosure, when this vulnerability was found, it was estimated that about 17% of the internet was vulnerable to the flaw here. And you can see, uh, and when it was around, when it was announced, there were about oh, just under 400,000 public web servers that had the vulnerability. Three years later, that dropped down to 144,000. And in 2019, just a few years ago, there were still 90, over 90,000 devices that were susceptible to it. And then the website that tracked that went offline. So I don't know <laughs> what it's like today. <laughs> Maybe they got hacked by OpenSSO. I don't know. But I, I don't, uh, we're not going to be talking specifically about the coordination of this. But Heartbleed highlighted a problem that is uh, very common within many open source projects, critical or not. Um, at the time the vulnerability was published, OpenSSL had two full-time developers. And they were managing about 500,000 lines of code for the uh, development, maintenance, 
testing, patching. It's a lot of work for two people for a library that essentially was the foundation of the internet. Mm -hmm. We're going to throw some statistics at you again to try just to kind of remind you why this is a, a very omnipresent problem. Uh, depending on what day of the week and which website or which company's article you read, open source software is a major component of 80 to 90 percent of all software that exists. So regardless of the specific number, it's an incredibly high volume. Uh, one report found that about 84 percent of these code bases had at least one vulnerability in them. Uh, with the average of that set having about 158 vulnerabilities in the code base. Uh, depending on uh, the report you're looking at, the uh, average applications can have 118 libraries, with roughly a third of them only being in active development. So fully two-thirds of the dependencies of a project might not even have active development on it. And you're looking at average library age of being about a little over two and a half years old. Uh, looking at a 10 year period of vulnerabilities within open source, uh, during that time frame, as measured by CVE, there was a four fold increase in 10 years. And that isn't necessarily that the code is worse today than it was back in days of yore. It's just that now we have a lot more eyes, um, a lot more people looking. They're interested, a lot more participants, so we're discovering a lot more vulnerabilities. But within that 10-year time span, a 4x increase of reported flaws that ultimately consumers had to end up dealing with through patches. Um, another study cites that open source vulnerabilities are often discovered through indirect dependencies and some Sobering facts here, a typical vulnerability can go undetected for about 218 weeks. It uh, typically takes four weeks to get resolved once a project is alerted to it. So uh, flaws are around for a very long time potentially and can take a considerable amount of effort and time once they're reported. And I would say on the indirect dependencies, we're not just talking one hop of you know one package away. People are familiar with Log4Shell. That was the incident with Log4J. I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th there's a team called Open Source Insights that's kind of tracking a lot of this dependency. You can access their website at depths.dev. And what they found when Log4Shell came out was that on average, it was eight layers deep in somebody's tree. That's where it was. So when we think about vulnerability management, it's not just one hop away. It is branched so far out, I hope you can find it. Well, and think about that in regards to SBOM. I know there's a debate about how far down do SBOMs do their review. And if Log4J was an average of eight layers deep. It's a big SBOM. Uh, good luck. <laughs> so my context here is to share with you Vulnerabilities in open source can be found up and down the stack. If you look at, uh, for example, the SolarWinds attack, that was not necessarily a problem with open source, but an open source library was compromised, and that was way in the back end of their systems. Uh, thinking further towards in the middleware, our friend Log4J, which I just heard about just now, uh, <laughs> that's considered middleware, so in the middle of your app stack. And then you also may have heard of a little organization called Equifax. Really nice folks had uh, some opportunities keeping up with timely patches. Well, that was on the front end of their systems. So open source is everywhere, up and down the stack. So there is not any one specific area you can focus on and try to whack that mole and keep it gone. So let's talk about how truly massive this massiveness is. Oh, should we do like some crowd work? Maybe? Ooh, let's do crowd work. That's I fun. like that. All right. So um, maybe when people think of proprietary software, can we think of some factors that uh, make it a target for adversaries? Mm. Ooh, yes, sir, in the back there. Critical infrastructure, certainly, yes. The system is critical to my company. Certainly a reason to attack it. We had a gentleman here in the second row. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and sorry, just repeating the questions for our folks online, or the answers for folks online, you know, maybe somebody's reverse engineering it because it was closed source, so they got curious, pulled it apart, found something interesting. 
let's flip to open source. You know, I think uh, what makes this a challenging, massive problem is some of the things that we love about open source. It's public facing source code. So like your fine example of uh, where somebody had to really go and reverse engineer it, source is available to everyone. Super easy. Super easy, yeah. Community driven development. Uh, including the ability you know, to use pseudonyms, to be anonymous. We like these things about open source. We like working together. We like having you know, kind of our, our ways that people like to handle their identities as respected in open source. A tragedy of the commons. You know, I was talking this morning about when it comes to security, open sources are critical public infrastructure. Um, if one bit, like Crobe was talking about OpenSSL, mm -hmm. that was really, really critical to folks when unmaintained, can have massive impact. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. A lack of consistency in security standards, reviews, and tooling. You know, developers are out there on their own using what they have available to them and what they're familiar with. That can mean projects that range widely in what their security hardening looks like. Well, and that's also the beauty of working in a community is you get together and you agree upon your methodologies and your tools, and that isn't necessarily exactly the same way your neighbors uh, do that, which is good for you, bad for a little challenging for consumers. Certainly, certainly. And, but still, you know, if we jump back down to the end, still a high value target. Mm -hmm. There are many consumers, companies, take a walk on across our show floor here today. Um, many companies are now relying on open source. It is critical. So the other thing that makes this so difficult when we talk about vulnerability management is we are not just talking about one particular threat vector. Mm -hmm. Um, this bottom diagram is from slsa.dev, the Salsa project. It is a uh, beautified interpretation of <laughs> <laughs> this uh, more academic report on supply chain security. But essentially, they're, they're saying the same thing, that you, know, you can look at these red caution triangles or danger, danger here. Uh, there's eight up there. And that's eight different uh, attack, you know, attack points that an, an attacker can take to your system here from social engineering on your developer, identity takeover, we're moving into our source code, injecting malicious source, moving into our build system, can compromise the whole darn build system, can inject something in a dependency, can compromise the package through something like typo squatting, mm -hmm. and then it finally gets to the consumer. <laughs> and each of those different triangles has to be mitigated a different way. Mm -hmm. These are different attacks after all. So that's what makes this all a very challenging, massive problem. We, our, our comedy show will be going on the road next summer. <laughs> Hope you can join us for tour. Sure, uh, tip your waitresses. Yeah. <laughs> Try the veal. So yes, you know, just keep driving at home. Um, open source projects, on average, have 180 package dependencies. Um, top 50 open source projects. The most downstream dependencies had an average of 3.6 million projects dependent on them. Ooh. So if you're you know, a visual person, again, you can go to, I love this, I'll just keep plugging this depths.dev visualization. If you put in a package name, there's a dependent and a dependent number, and you can see like, oh, maybe I have my dependents, and then, or dependencies, but then my dependents just go out and out and out. We love package reuse and <laughs> makes our graphs large. Uh, and the, you know, the Spider-Man helps illustrate uh, one of the awesome things about open source is you develop your project and you can pull in all these other great ideas as a consumer or a defender, that gets very challenging. And you also have the ability that once you pull down potentially one version of the package, you can pull in whole bunches of extra stuff to help support that. Yay. <laughs> Yay, users. <laughs> the creation of potentially exploitable vulnerabilities increasingly outpaces the rate at which we can search and remediate them. Mm -hmm. And this is only getting worse with time. So as Krob was talking about, you know, that chart earlier where we're talking about known CVEs, uh, that doesn't mean, like he was saying, our code is getting worse or that uh, things are more insecure. It's that we're, these are known vulnerabilities. The unknowns continue to compile on and on and on and just increase in time. Mm -hmm. Just give you some more data, drive it home. The number ah. of vulnerabilities in the wild. Because they weren't oh. sad enough, Anne. Oh. <laughs> We're going to make them happy at the end, right? We are. We're going to make, you're going to cheer. Oh, excellent. Everyone's going to, uh, not everybody eats lobster. Anyways, carrying on. It's the afternoon. We're feeling punchy. Um, 
Yes. So, you know, every year more lines of open source are written than ever before because we're all becoming participants in this ecosystem. We're pulling things down from Docker Hub and we're pushing them back up to do a favor for our friends. Well, that's lovely, but we are adding to this, this collection mm -hmm. of how much open source is out there in the world. Um, vulnerabilities seem to scale with lines of code, but other metrics aside from lines of code show similar patterns with this. And we're talking about that continuous increase. Mm -hmm. And the number of reported vulnerabilities in open source code bases is growing every year. So we're finding them. That means we have to remediate them and respond to them, which is a whole other tax on maintainers. And, and to Anne's comment about, you know, your friend puts some patches into your repository, that's awesome, but not everybody has the same capabilities, the same tooling to help them, the same training, the same uh, support ecosystem. They might not have a second developer to review the code with them. They might not have specific expertise in doing security auditing on reviewing code. So it's not everybody, not all patches are equal. But I think we're here to offer you some solutions and some suggestions on how we might be able to stem some of this more like working together. Uh, first and foremost, I think uh, many of us in the room feel very strongly about this first thing. If you consume something, it's really important that you need to understand uh, what's going on with that project. You need to monitor it. And whenever, you know, as new updates are patched and pushed, you need to upgrade along with it to keep pace. So to remove any known or unknown flaws. Uh, different from vendor software, open source, you know, generally with a vendor, when you have a commercial entity supplying you software, they have mechanisms to reach out to their customer base. And just the very free flow nature of open source, the fact that you know, we all kind of uh, depend and consume each other, uh, it's sometimes can be very challenging. Different communities communicate differently on, hey, I patched the thing. Uh, some of them may say I patched a thing. Some of them might never say they patched anything. Some might have a very nice security advisory. Others might not tell you there's any security implications at all in the patch, but as of responsible consumers, you need to make sure you understand you're monitoring that community and as whatever, however they're communicating updates and patches, you need to be able to get that alert and analyze it in regards to your utilization of that software. You know, potentially there's a patch upstream that fixes a thing and your implementation of that software might not include that area of the code base. So you might not necessarily need to react quickly. Um, and the, if you get nothing else, if you are not an open source maintainer, uh, you need to understand that open source maintainers have very little understanding of who uses their projects. Unlike a commercial vendor that has a customer list and a sales team and has very well managed understanding of who uses them, upstream maintainers don't have that insight. They don't, they generally, uh, it's not as interesting to them. You know, they may have partnerships where you know, I understand that my project is baked into the Kubernetes ecosystem, um, but in general, if you're looking at the millions of open source projects, those maintainers don't understand who uses them. And they definitely don't understand how you've taken their software, put it in to solve your business problem, how you've configured it. And uh, so the whole log for j uh, debacle from my standpoint is when you had downstream consumers uh, yelling upstream at the maintainers and asking them to fill out their uh, risk assessment, uh, that's just not, that doesn't jive with how open source software works. That maintainer would have no idea how any of those layers and layers of downstream consumers uh, leverage that or that he even got put in there at all. Anything more to add there? No, you hit it all out of the park, Crub. All right. Yes, so you know this idea of what can we do though beyond responsible consumption? So you're a user, you're keeping track of your dependencies, you're monitoring vulnerabilities. What else is a way that you can kind of help this, this dynamic? I have an interesting idea that's never been floated before. Really? I think maybe if you use software from a project that you could contribute back to that project uh, to kind of help them know and understand that you use and love their software and you want to help make their software better. <laughs> and our approach, uh, in addition to that, contributing back to software you use, is uh, 
find areas where you can coordinate and work with others to try to help make software better. Uh, this is a big laundry list of stuff uh, that we put together as part of the OpenSSF, just kind of brainstorming on things we can do to help improve the overall security posture of any project. But you know, thing if you're a traditional infosec person doing things like threat modeling, uh, most upstream maintainers might not understand those concepts. And that's something by working with a friend that understands how to do that, maybe you could, that's something you could donate to the project. Hey, let me help you walk you through a threat model to show you all the areas where how your application might be broken. Uh, we like to try to be data driven. We have a project within the foundation called the Critical Projects Group. And they are working with organizations like Harvard and others to try to analyze use patterns of software and identify those most used, most critical pieces of software, and then we can uh, focus our efforts on those first, because knowing that we can't help all 60, 80, 100 million open source projects, but we know we can start with projects that have a broad exposure, broad usage, and if we're able to affect those, ideally we'll be able to work our way down and help everybody else. Um, one of the things we're doing as part of like Alpha and Omega is working with uh, upstream projects. Um, I believe Amir mentioned it the other day that they, working with one of the projects, they were able to eliminate not just individual vulnerabilities, but hopefully you can eliminate whole classes of issues. You know, teaching those developers how to avoid things like SQL injection or using better memory management or avoiding buffer overflows. You can eliminate whole classes of vulnerabilities at once. So instead of eliminating onesie, twosie, threesie, you can eliminate whole things, whole cloth. Um, we're working on continued tool development. So there's work on things like OSS fuzz and uh, other tools where we're trying to invest, find ways to um, automate security practices for developers to make it easier for them so that they can ease, either integrate that into their development environments and their IDEs or plug it into their CI CD pipelines, however it might be, whether it's a, a fuzzer or a static analysis or whatever it might be. Including a GitHub app called AllStar. So if you, you know, takeaways from today, yeah, if you have a GitHub start. repo, locking that down, if you remember our chart with all the little red, red uh, attack vectors there, um, AllStar is an app in the OpenSSF. It's available on GitHub, and hopefully one day there will be a non-GitHub available version of it as well. Uh, but essentially, it is auto, kind of auto-correcting your GitHub policies to enforce best security practices. So with that one click, you can have something working through, taking a look, keeping you in line with where you want to go. So those are the kinds of tools that the OpenSSF mm -hmm. has been working on. Absolutely. And you know, GitHub is one of the biggest repositories of software on the internet. It's not the only one. We also try to work with GitLab and other repositories. And one of our chief goals is, as we find a tool, is we want to make sure that it's usable in as many places as possible. And it's not always available day one, but that generally is always in the backlog. So you say, hey, I'm a GitLab user. Can I get AllStar? Well, let's get an issue open for that and make sure we get some people working on that conversion so it works in that environment for you. Uh, we're also working on better vulnerability disclosure practices, which is the whole theme of this little track. And I think a, a fine red-haired young lady had a little talk about it this morning. Yeah. Um, but that's one thing we're committed to, is to try to find ways to teach maintainers, teach projects and communities to be able to um, intake and evaluate a vulnerability and have a process that they can share that with their, their ecosystem and their consumers. So we have a lot of different things we'll talk about in a minute. And then kind of thinking about the foundation itself is trying to hope, focus and coordinate uh, funding so that we can have this high impact, so that we can try to, again, eliminate whole classes of issues or um, kind of whole patterns of problems at once. Let's talk a little bit about the seven working groups. It will soon be eight, but now it's seven. You want to start? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think what we were, most of the room knew of the OpenSSF, but maybe three or four hands said they were active. So see if any of these working groups resonate with you with, you, with things you like to work on or think would be most beneficial for your work. So best practices for open source developers. Yay! <laughs> these are things where uh, you know that tooling really lives, tools like all-star, scorecards, um, thinking about from the developer experience what can be most useful and how do we get that education out there. 
securing critical projects, like Krobe was talking about, you know, there are millions upon millions of packages, but is there a set of 150 that we should really be thinking about first? Because when we talk about those dependencies and that blast radius of open source, um, are those the ones that, you know, if we can make the most change if we focus there. Mm -hmm. Supply chain integrity, Krobe, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, that, that's a group of people focused in on how to uh, promote things like the Salsa framework. I believe that is a sub-project that lives there, but trying to help uh, not only harden infrastructure that we're aware of, but also, again, teaching developers on how to configure these tools well, how to uh, get the most bang for their buck, and ultimately kind of thinking through um, uh, the, the supply chain and the, the complex web of dependencies that exist in software we use. Um, we have a, a new working group that they're focused in on secu securing software repositories. So think about things like Maven, um, uh, the, the NPM, NPM environment. Mm -hmm. So these, so we're looking at creating very specific uh, practices, tools, and uh, processes to help secure these very critical uh, infrastructures that really are kind of the big, uh, one of the big. Uh, points where folks get how folks get software. Uh, we have identifying security threats in open source projects. So this would be things um, along um, thinking about uh, things like threat modeling. I believe that's where uh, the uh, scorecards is used a lot, kind of identifying. There's a list of good practices, and every week they're scanning about a million different projects and they're able to kind of showcase, hey, these things have some uh, things that kind of deviate from what we think is good practice. You might, you know, consumers might want to uh, investigate a little more. Security tooling, I must have had some of your Texas lobster for lunch where I <laughs> mixed up that uh, best practices, mostly content and development. Security tooling, that's where places like Scorecards and All Star live. Vulnerability disclosure is my favorite working group. I think Krobe has told me it's his favorite working group. Once or twice. Is our next slide our final Our next guide? slide is our kind of call to action. So we have, and we will be adding a, based off of OpenSSF day. So we had a whole day of the conference focused in on OpenSSF things. And based off of that day, I believe we're gonna be adding an eighth working group focused in on AI and machine learning. So that's another area where we have identified there's a potential problem set and we're gonna to try to get some industry experts together to start thinking about it and hopefully avoid some problems down the road. But more specifically, the foundation got together. Uh, question? Quick question, sorry. Uh, for those that are interested in working groups, where can they find the links to go join the GitHub and Slack? And the That's a great well, fun fact, if you wait just a couple more slides, I may have <laughs> links at the end. Um, but it's all, um, OpenSSF.org is the primary landing page, and that's where you can find links to uh, the calendar, links to the Slack, links to all the working group repos. But we'll get to that very soon, sir. My, we staged that. But so has anyone ever heard of the uh, White House executive order on cybersecurity that recently came out? Oh, fun. Look at this whole well-educated group. Well-educated group. Well, the foundation uh, recognized that this was kind of a very important call to arms. So many of us in the foundation got together and we developed a 10 point plan where we have listed a prescriptive set of ideas and tasks that we want to accomplish to help um, generically open source, but specifically for the benefit of the open source ecosystem and open source consumers by helping improve the security posture in areas like uh, security education, which there's a, a special interest group that will start meeting the first week of August focusing in on how do we take those developer best practices and how do we provide that education to uh, people going for a college degree, people going through trade school, people going through boot camps, uh, high schools, uh, professional certifications, or people kind of uh, changing careers. So we're looking at chopping up our content, adding more content, and finding ways to get that out into the hands of learners so we can kind of spread and hopefully get more people actively type it on keyboards a little better in the future. Uh, we, our next group would be the risk assessment group. This is leveraging the work of things like Scorecard and All Stars, where they'll be providing a dashboard 
to allow consumers of open source to understand kind of the, the risk properties of these different projects and help describe the practices that they use or don't use possibly. You want to talk about Digital Six? Sure, yeah, signing. This is kind of when we go back to, again, that uh, graph with the, the red danger, danger. Um, being able to verify that a package is what it is and digital signatures are a really big part of that. So there's a project, SigStore, that's looking Six into store. <laughs> one way to do this, um, but really a big focus area on thinking about how can we apply cryptographic signing to these packages to think about provenance and integrity. Mm -hmm. And do memory safety? Memory safety, yes. So have people seen things, you know, kind of different initiatives like such and such got rewritten in Rust? People seen a little, little bit of that here and there? Yeah. So I see somebody in the back who pumped for Rust. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that's one initiative you'll see in the industry and something that the OpenSF is, you know, cares a lot about as well. Um, memory safety is kind of addressing this class of uh, vulnerabilities that come when memory overflows and certain languages are more prone to this than others mm -hmm. and a lot of you know kind of things that we've been uh, dependent on for a long time are written in languages like C so people are going back and rewriting things in languages like Rust that have a little bit better in memory safety and memory handling. Mm -hmm. Incident response. Woo! That's us. Uh, <laughs> go for it, Crow. Yeah. So also, the first week of July, we'll start a SIG. Um, the idea put forward is the creation of an open source security and incident response team. So we're going to be working with the community to help refine that idea, find something that's actionable. Uh, maybe there are people that volunteer for office hours. Maybe a certain set of people are hired. More likely, I think we're going to curate a lot of the good practice and very aggressively kind of go out and help evangelize. Here's how CVD works. Here's some tools you need. There's some amazing tools we're thinking about adopting potentially. Um, the Vince uh, vulnerability disclosure tool is something that they just recently uh, CERT CC open sourced. And that is a mechanism that we might be able to endorse maintainers to use to help uh, broadcast and coordinate information around flaws that are reported to them. Uh, lots of good activity there, and we're very excited about that. Uh, what else do we have? We have better scanning. So uh, who here has ever read the results of a fuzzer? Who here liked reading the results of a fuzzer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're god-awful. Uh, it's thousands and thousands of lines of gibberish. Most of it tends to be false positives. So this is a group of folks that were dedicated towards um, focusing first on open source scanning tools and trying to identify ways we can make those uh, open source fuzzers and scanners more reliable so that the results are more actionable once that scan's been run. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully we can endorse you know, developers start to use them because uh, scanning use today is challenging for a developer. It's uh, very archaic and hard to read and we want to fix that. Yeah. And just because we only had about four hands go up for people who have read scanning yeah, yeah, yeah. fuzzing results, for the rest of you, if you want to get into fuzzing, there's some, uh, apply that to your project. So, oh, Jeff, fuzzing <laughs> oh, is great. Jeff. Essentially, if you're not, are people familiar with that? Is that, Jen? I see a couple head nods. Okay. Essentially, TLDRs, it's like throwing garbage at your project to see what happens. And sometimes what happens is you find there are issues. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there are issues like it raises things like memory safety, all this stuff, because bananas, things will happen. Monkeys at typewriters. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, so, anyways, there's a handful of projects within the OpenSF to help uh, get fuzzing to folks. O uh, OSS Fuzz is one of them. There's some infrastructure called Cluster Fuzz, if that interests you. <laughs> if you're not ready for the full Cluster Fuzz, there's Cluster Fuzz Lite. So just things to poke around, apply to you. <laughs> right, yeah, this is, this is, oh, Tough there was a, time kid of the year was here, I better, uh -oh. I don't know. <laughs> Let, let's move on to the next one, Crow. Question? That's actually one of the ways the hot was found. Yeah. Yeah. For, so, for the virtual audience, the comment was that one of the ways that Heartbleed was found was through a fuzzer. Mm -hmm. So they have their uses. They can be a little challenging. We want to make that better, that experience better for the developer. Um, code audits. Uh, if you weren't aware, one of the most effective information security practices around application security is an expert code audit. Reading the code line by line, working with the developer, Going through it, it's very tedious, it's very time-consuming and expensive, but it will find problems that 
scanner, automated scanners will overlook. And so one of the things we're looking at doing through like the Alpha and Omega project is taking um, a handful of these critical projects and sitting down and giving them an expert code review and hopefully correct uh, some egregious problems before they become CVEs. Uh, we're looking at creating a data sharing mart. So this is something that's still being developed. So if you're interested in data around open source, the foundation is looking at ways at collecting anonymized information about open source usage, being able to provide that to researchers uh, for the, so the broader community can learn more about uh, how open source is used. And then we have, oh, we're gonna skip that one. And uh, we're gonna look at improving software security but supply chain. <laughs> Oh, yes, we're looking at S-bombs everywhere. This has been a long effort. I've been talking with certain people about S-bomb for five years now. Yeah. So we're looking at trying to find ways to bringing S-bomb to open source maintainers so that it's easy. We don't want to put more burdensome tasks on the maintainers and projects, but we want to find ways. Um, the downstream community, there's a lot of benefit from having these S-bombs, so we want to try to find ways and simple tools that developers can quickly and hopefully automatedly generate these S-bombs so that downstream can take that and make decisions on based off of what's inside the software. Mm -hmm. And then again, working on including in, improving supply chain security. So if you're curious about the plan, there is an awesome link that you could go read the 10-point plan. If you're interested in participating in any of those efforts, whether it's the plan itself or any of the working groups, you can talk to Ann or myself or any of the folks from the OpenSSF. We'll be glad to help get you routed to an exciting community um, of vibrant, active people. Let's see. Where, oh, I don't have it on this one. I have it on the other one. Oh, so pardon me one second. So fun fact, Ann and I are giving a panel speech with the greatest hair in cybersecurity in just uh, about 20 minutes upstairs on fourth floor where we'll be talking, we'll have a conversation about preparing for zero day with Art Manion, with Ann and I. But here is uh, a list of some pretty awesome links. And I think, if I go back a slide, where is it? There it is. There we so go. So here is all the um, OpenSSF uh, links. But if you want to join a working group, you can go to GitHub OpenSSF and explore there. You can go to OpenSSF.org is an HTML page if you prefer that. Uh, we have a metric ton of uh, mailing lists, including the announce list, which is where announcements are made. We have public calendars, and we have a Slack on Slack.OpenSSF.org where all the working groups uh, work uh, transparently, transparently in the open. We have a YouTube channel where you can watch every working group ever recorded. Uh, so you can watch. So if you don't get enough meetings during your day, you can go home <laughs> and watch meetings about open source on YouTube at night. Uh, very excited. But then if you have a question specifically about anything in the foundation, operations at OpenSSF.org. So we've got. I, I just want to make a quick plug that um, we've had meetings in the past, and we will have them in the future. So recognizing that March oh, 21st yeah. has passed. So Sorry. head to the calendar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but so does the room have questions we can answer before we get kicked out? I, I did have a quick question, which was there's um, there seemed to be a little overlap between the work the open SF working groups and the mobilization plan buckets. Huh. Yes. Talk a little bit about which ones we should be joining, should we be joining both? What's the organization? The question was, there appears to be some overlap or some synergy between items in the mobilization plan and uh, official work groups. So the answer is yes. Uh, next question. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, yes, the, and that is something we're working on. Ideally, each of the work streams from the plan will either be homed within one of the existing working groups or potentially a new working group will be spun up that focuses only on that effort. So for example, stream one, which was education, will be owned by the development best practices working group. And then stream five, which was open source cert, that'll be owned by the vulnerability disclosures group. But ideally, each of these work streams will get funneled into one of the working groups. If you want to participate in both, you may, I do. Um, but some, uh, generally the working groups tend to more towards writing 
uh, white papers or procedures or software, whereas these work streams are going to be focused on, we have this plan, we need to refine the budget, and we're going to start taking action as soon as we can. So the question was, um, each of the work streams, is there a, a definitive documented plan or is it more open-ended, like we're going to fix the supply chains? Um, the answer is yes, each of those work streams has right now a proposed plan. It has proposed uh, resources that are needed to accomplish that plan. And what uh, people like myself who are adopting these streams our job is going to be to review the plan. Is it still accurate? Does the community agree with it? And then strive to uh, tighten up the estimates and then actually formally put a budget request together to say this is what this is going to take to solve X or Y problem. Any other questions? Any questions online? Oh, yay, online. <laughs> Dylan. Oh, I see. Well, yeah, one more. This is sort of a philosophical question, I guess. You, had, you were talking at the beginning of your presentation about this huge dependency graph, so that it's getting created. Is there any work going on to figure out how much of that code is actually ever used in projects mm. in general? Because it feels to me like you're dragging along a huge amount of vulnerabilities with your project that for code that you never actually use. That's a great question. It's great. And it's, I think it's a little bit of a known some of it's a known problem. I can give you an, an example that um, until very recently, I believe Kubernetes had a PDF reader in it, which, <laughs> you know, super useful. Um, so, so you're, oh, and I apologize for the folks online. Uh, do, 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 question. You apologize to Dylan online who didn't have a question? Who didn't read the question. The question was, you know, is there anybody looking at um, a project does not necessarily actually use all the code and what it's ingesting through a package because of its use case? What can we do to, look at that, identify that, and you know, chop it off because we're not using that. Um, I think that's a great question. To your point, we were dragging along all those vulnerabilities. I'd love to see somebody look more into yeah. making that actionable otherwise, other than just saying, we know there's a PDF reader in Kubernetes. I'm not aware of any specific efforts focused on that right now, but that definitely is something we can recommend to like Alpha and Omega, who's going to be engaging 150 project, most critical, and then like oh, 10,000 uh, others, so that we definitely can recommend that as a practice that as you're going through any kind of review or a good practice for projects is to periodically review uh, dependencies and make sure that things are still relevant. Well, yeah, I'm more thinking an individual dependency. You may do 50 things and you only want one of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we have, if, if you are interested and passionate about that, we would well, patches are always welcome. Okay. <laughs> any other questions or comments? Are we all excited? All right. Well, we did thank you, Anne. Awesome thank you, job. Probe. Well done. Thank you all. Uh, if you have any questions, we're around. And we're going to go have an exciting panel discussion on vulnerabilities in just a few minutes. Thanks, all.